Hello all, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for my 1.6 scale M26 T26 E3 Persian. In this video, I'll talk about the model's background as well as all the features that went into this model when it was being built. As for the model's background, this model is 1.6 scale and it is all scratch built. The model itself was built in 2010, however the hull itself for the model was actually given to me by another customizer who started the project back in 2001, but it never progressed past the plain basic hull. The hull, as we can see from these pictures here, was uh, originally made out of, I uh, believe, eighth or a quarter of an inch thick styrene plates. Those styrene plates were just assembled to give you just the basic lower tub. Everything else that you see on the model now has all been scratch built by hand. From the time I worked on the project, the model took about six months to build. And once complete, was probably the only 1.6 scale M26 Pershing T26 E3 currently assembled in 1.6 scale. As I mentioned earlier, the model is static and it's also scratch built. As for the materials used, the model features pretty much all materials under the, the sun, including plastics, resins, metal, and even in some places wood. To view more images of this model in both construction as well as it being complete, I made a gallery webpage for this model and that can be found on the eastcoastarmory.com product line via the link that's listed below. Also, this model has been, well, while it was being built, was posted on all the ones on the 135th scale as well as on the 1.6 scale modeling forums. And those links can be found with a simple Google search of 1.6 scale M26 Pershing. In addition to being published online, the model was also published in the November 2011 version of Fine Scale Modeler magazine. Let's start with first a quick walk around the model. Starting with the suspension and the running gear, the model features all of the accurate representation of the M26's torsion bar suspension, as well as with its shock absorbers and spring bump stops. The suspension on this model is all static and is non-functional. All of the components that you see here are posted on the eastcoastarmory.com product line and are offered for as aftermarket parts in case anyone else is intending on scratch building an M26 Pershing. The wheels are very realistically done in that the wheels themselves assemble like the real one. You have two separate dish pans for the wheel and they all mount together on the central hub here. Here's a quick image of what they look like during construction to get an idea of what I'm referring to. A lot of time and care was also done in researching the sprocket. The sprocket that this tank is fitted with is the type for the, the double pin type track instead of the single pin track which utilized a different sprocket. Also if we notice the sprocket has the mud slits integral into the casting as well as the retention equipment. Even the the guide tooth guide rail. All these parts are available on the eastcoastarmory.com product line. Also as we notice all of the zerk fittings on all the hubcaps as well as on the swing arms themselves are painted red. This is as per the real vehicle and lets the 
operator know where to apply his grease gun so that he could properly lubricate all the fittings. All casted components have their rough cast texture as well as their casting numbers. And all detail and fastener and other components are represented. In addition to the suspension, the model has all of its proper weld detail and indentation marks. These were taken directly off of welder plans that were from the M26 production run. The M26 hull was actually pretty complicated in that you had several sections of rolled steel that were mated with cast sections of armored steel that would have comprised the front armored section and the back armored section here, not to mention all the elaborate hull angles that are found on the M26 series. All casting surfaces have been represented and all of their cast texture is present on the model. In this angle here, you can see that all, even the underhull detailing has been assembled, including the two escape hatches for the driver and the assistant driver. In addition to the escape hatches, all of the underhull access panels have also been added, as well as their drainage plugs. These can be seen better in the following image. In addition to the running gear, the model's final drives have also been built and are also very detailed. These final drives are another component that's posted on the EastCoastArmory.com product line alongside with the running gear for the M26 Pershing. Just like with everything else, it has all of its fastener, rough cast, as well as casting number detail present. Moving up from the running gear, we'll start here with the rear wall. Start here with the rear detailing. Again, if we notice the weld marks are present as per the real vehicle, including the axis cap that we have over there. The tow hitch mount is present, as well as the tow eye hookups. If you notice, one is thinner than the other. That's as per the real vehicle. Just like on all the M26 Pershings, the tow hitch is actually stowed in this little rack over here as opposed to always being kept in the tow hitch mount like it would be on the Shermans. Tow hitch mount is all fabricated out of sheet metal, it's all soldered together. Tow hitch itself is the EastCoastArmory.com resin version and that's also found on the product line. These here are the hookups for the tow cable. If you notice, the tow cable is not fitted to this model. Tow cable clamp is also fully functional in that it can open up, swivel open, and I could actually lock a real tow cable in there if I ever deem fit of installing one myself. Moving our way to the M26 is one of the key most features on the M26, which is the exhaust travel lock cluster. This piece here is all made out of resin and is fully functional. I can open it up and actually stow the gun in the travel position. Once the latch is fully undone, the piece will pivot open and is hinged, double hinged just like the real tank. Also, like the real tank, I have the canvas barrel marrying protector, which will protect the barrel from getting marred when in the stowed position. Now, as of note, this tank is a T26E3, which means it receives this early style travel lock. The problem with the M26 was that what was discovered was that this mount here, the casting, was actually weak and that prolonged use of the travel lock would actually put too much strain on the casting itself and would crack the real exhaust manifold right here at where they connect. This was addressed and on later versions of the M26 Pershing, the travel lock was redesigned to mount to the rear wall itself around the exhaust. Several versions of the exhaust were made. The first version was the version here that the pieces connect to and they have the integral mounts. The second version still had the integral mounts but they were not tapped and drilled as the travel lock was moved to the engine or to the rear wall. 
Finally, uh, this was resolved on the M26A1 where the travel lock was moved from the rear deck entirely and placed right behind here on the radiator fl fluid cover cap right in this location around here. Moving on from the travel lock, we'll go here towards the rear tail lights. If we notice the, real t the rear tail lights are made up of two or three components. You have the actual guard mounts that are welded to the body and then the sheet metal guard itself is bent over the tail light and is then affixed via fasteners. This is as per the real vehicle. Also as of note, like with all American AFV, the tail light that is on the left hand side or the driver's side is red while the blackout light on the reverse side is painted black. This is a staple on all American tanks from this era, including tanks such as the M3 Lee, the Sherman, as well as the Stewart. Moving our way to the fenders and the tin work. The tin work on this model is probably one of the more extensive tin work I've done on a model tank. All of the, sh the fenders are made out of sheet metal as well as the boxes. It's all soldered and bolted together in the same exact locations that they would be found on the real vehicle. To mount the fender to the sidewall, a steel angle mount was fabricated and had to be hand crimped for it to work with this elaborate curve that we see here. These fasteners are all real and are the actual fasteners that keep the tin work to the model as well as the fender. If we notice on the rear portion here, we have an X crimp. This is for rigidity purposes. The X crimp is actually crimped into the steel. On this portion here of the rear hull, we have here our first aid kit. This is just a first aid kit cover, and the first aid kit would be a small little box that would slide in here. The piece is functional, however, it always seems, on my model, it always seems to flop open on me. The cover itself is affixed to the tank via two straps. The straps are soldered and bolted for extra support. The first aid kit is a component found on the EastCoastArmory.com product line. On the reverse side we have the same detail. Only on this side here you can really appreciate more of the mounting surface. Also on the mounting surface it is welded to the model in segments. This is also as per the real model or the real vehicle. This version on the fender is a little bit different than the reverse side with the first aid kit in that it has tarpaulin mounts that would be fitted in this location here and then securing belt loops would go ahead and secure it to the fender. These mounts here, all these footman loops are all soldered directly to the metal just like on the real tank where they would have been spot welded. On later versions of the M26, like the M26A1 and even into the M46 and M46 Pat or M47 patents, these fenders were deemed to have there be too large and a little wobbly. So what was done was a turnbuckle system that would mount on the rear portion like that and to the rear wall of the hull. And what that did was it gave the fender more stability and more structural strength. After the M47 series into the M48, the turnbuckle feature was dropped. Also on the turnbuckle was not only found on the rear portion but also on the front portion of the fenders as well. And again this would have been on later versions of the M26, M26A1, and the M46 and M47 patterns. Moving our way with the tin work. If we notice on the side of the model, holes have been drilled into the fender. These holes here would be for the side skirts, which would be bolted on in panels on the tank. This model, however, does not have that feature, but however, the mounting holes are still present. The mounting holes are in the same exact locations as they would be on the real tank, as well as the proper numbers. Just like with the rear fender, this side here of the tank features many footman loops, which would have been used to mount on screw equipment again with the belt system. Americans like using the belt system to mount on their equipment while the Germans like the clamp system. All of these footman loops were all made out of steel and are then soldered to the model just like they were on the rear fender as well as they would have been on the real tank. To secure these panels to the tank they are actually bolted onto the fender mounts. This Pershing had a very elaborate mounting system as well as all the other post-war 
vehicles of the time, such as the T-55, as well as the Centurion. The way these fenders lock on would be just like on the rear vehicle. These fender mounts are mounted to the hull via welds. The mounts themselves, again, are all made out of sheet metal and are all soldered together. On the M26 also had fender extenders. The fender mount, you can see over here, is one plate with this little square welded to it. Then you would have this little fender extender, which was pressed sheet metal, and that would have been bolted to the fender mount. This is found on all of the fender mount on the model and was assembled the same way it was on the real tank. Not only were the fender mounts a uh, straight piece on top, they were also teed off on the bottom. This plate here is the bottom portion of the fender mount, and the fender mount itself is soldered to the center portion of that plate. Then holes were drilled into it, and the fenders are simple panels, and they just get bolted to the fender mounts, as they would on the real vehicle, and that's why we have these fasteners located on the deck. Like with the rear fender, these fasteners actually hold up the fender work as they would on the real one. The reverse side features the same type of detailing. The front fender is unique in that once it emerges past the armored plate, it actually extends outward into the glass's plate. This here is found on both sides of the model. Also, as we notice, the front fender pl cap plate that we have here simply bolts on and has a little L bracket that is welded to the front armor plate, which in then is bolted to the front uh, fender, which holds it everything in place. Just like on the real M26 Pershing, it's actually in an angle, which follows the contour of the actual fender plate. Like with the rear, these two rigidity bulges are pressed into the steel. Moving our way to the boxes, the M26 featured its crew equipment and tools in sealed metal boxes, which are found on the two side fenders. This is in contrast to the earlier American vehicles, which featured all of their tools exposed to the elements, like on vehicles such as the M4 Sherman and M5 Stewart. This toolbox layout was pretty much used, utilized all the way through the M60, as well as the M48 patterns. The toolboxes themselves are all fabricated out of sheet metal and are functional. These little rest and latches here are fully functional. The design of the latches are actually identical to the ones used all the way up until the M60. They simply rotate. If we notice there's a little metal locking tab over here that's soldered to the plate. This would be for you to fix a padlock to prevent the, the, the handle from opening. You just rotate the two levers and the bin opens. This is true for every bin on this model. They are all fully functional. On the lids of the bin, we have the two locking tabs which connect to the little latches above. It's a simple little design that's very efficient. We have two little air escape breather valves which are found on all of the sheet metal boxes. On the inside we have a little gutter which on the real tank would also would trap any rainwater and also could be fitted with a rubber gasket if needed. On the lid here, we have two rigidity bolt, uh, rigidity strips that are soldered, spot soldered directly to the top deck. The spot welds are mirrored that on the real one. Depending which lid you use, depends how many rigidity ridges are welded to the box. On the inside, we have all of our tools. 
They're made out of metal and wood. Now there are actually more equipment that would be stowed inside the vehicle. However, I never got around to fabricating those components. However, the mounts are there and present in case I ever fabricate them. It's a simple drop-in installation. On the reverse side, mirrors the exact same details on the other. All the bins are, again, fully functional and open up. Also, as of note, all of the interior braces and segments are found on the real vehicle and are exactly like this on the actual on the actual tank. This rear box in the back would be for the crew equipment, which is why it is spacious and has nothing, no mounts or anything elaborate on the inside. While on the one in the front, each little bin is actually dedicated for a certain purpose.